This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our military who are joining us from remote outposts over the Internet today. Thank you for being with us again. And I also want to take a moment to thank Embellage and the Die Line for hosting my appearance in Paris this past week. They were such gracious hosts, and what a wonderful way to close out our road show for 2014. In just a moment, United States Permanent Representative to NATO under President Obama, Mr. Evo Dalder, will be joining the program to discuss Russia's latest denial that they are arming pro-Russian forces in the Ukraine, as well as Putin's hasty departure from the G20 summit. What can we read into that departure? There are few experts more qualified to speak on the need for NATO to respond to the crisis in the Ukraine than Evo Dalder. But before Mr. Dalder joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Evo Dalder was born in the Netherlands and is a U.S. citizen. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Kent, two master's degrees from Georgetown University and the University of Oxford, and his Ph.D. from MIT. He was a Pew Faculty Fellow in International Affairs at Harvard University and taught at the University of Maryland, where he was the Director of Research at the Center for International Security Studies. From 1997 to 2009, Dalder was a Senior Fellow at the acclaimed Brookings Institution. During the same time, he served as the Director for European European Affairs on the National Security Council under President Clinton, where Dalder was responsible for U.S. policy for Bosnia. By 2009, Dalder was more than ready to step into his role as the United States Permanent Representative to NATO, where he played a pivotal role in encouraging greater communication and coordination between European countries and NATO regarding security issues and was responsible for NATO's involvement in Libya following the Civil War an involvement which has been hailed as a model intervention wherein alliance partners came together to protect innocent civilians until Gaddafi could be overthrown and peace restored. Today, Mr. Dalder is the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And I should also add that uh, Mr. Dalder is a prolific author, having penned 12 best-selling books. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report, one of our nation's foremost experts on foreign policy and security, Mr. Evo Dalder. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Dalder. Uh, It's my pleasure, Rebecca. Really looking forward to the conversation. Now, I I don't like to assume that everyone listening uh, is completely up to speed on Russia's incursion into Crimea and the Ukraine. So uh, perhaps we could start there. Putin has flatly denied Russians' involvement. Uh, between pro and anti-Russian factions inside the Ukraine. But NATO, uh, along with other organizations, have observed multiple lines of Russian military equipment, including tanks, artillery, and combat troops. Have been, they have been moving into eastern Ukraine in, 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 so, as early as this past week. So where do we stand on this? Well, uh, I think it, it, it may be useful to, to go back a little further in history. Uh, just, uh, just six months ago, uh, it was in early March that uh, those famous green men uh, all of a sudden appeared in the Crimea, which is a part of Ukraine uh, uh, near uh, in, in the Black Sea. Uh, and at the time, Russia uh, did two things. First, they declared... Uh, through an act of parliament that Russia had the right to intervene and use force in Ukraine in order to de- to help defend Russian-speaking people. Uh, and secondly, they said that what was happening in Ukraine had nothing to do with what Russia was doing, that they didn't have any troops there, that those green men were uh, obviously local uh, local people, even though they were well-trained, well-armed, and, and had Russian uh, military equipment. We know what happened. Uh, those green men took control. Uh, of all the major uh, military and security uh, installations in Crimea. Uh, A very quick uh, referendum was organized uh, in which there was only one uh, uh, one way to vote, which was to to favor annexation of Crimea by Russia. And within three weeks, uh, Crimea had been taken over. Uh, Immediately thereafter, we continued to have other parts of Ukraine um, uh, where rebel forces... Uh, and separatist forces clearly supported by the Russians 
uh, were taking control of more and more territory. Uh, and when the Ukrainian military was able to push that back in, in August, uh, we had an outright in, in invasion by Russian troops, uh, large numbers of which uh, were killed. Uh, we found uh, all of a sudden trucks with uh, bodies going back into Russia, uh, Russian mothers uh, starting to protest about what was happening. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, there was a, a major military intervention at that time. Uh, fast forward to the last couple of weeks, we have again seen large numbers of Russian tanks, artillery, and troops crossing the border with Ukraine and reinforcing uh, the separatist forces in eastern Ukraine. Uh, we have pictures of them. They are uh, now with social media available on the Internet. Uh, these are the kinds of equipment that no other country but Russia possesses, uh, and it is clear that uh, we are at the brink of another, what I think fear is another major military confrontation. But uh, but w even with all this empirical evidence, right, satellite pictures, uh, pictures up on the Internet, you have Putin arriving at the G20 summit and saying, uh, listen, we're not as involved as you think. We're just trying to protect some Russian citizens. That's that's what he's saying. And I think uh, as, as Chancellor Merkel, the German chancellor, uh, has made clear that uh, uh, Putin seems to be living in what she calls an, another world. Uh, he, uh, he continues to lie about what he's doing, and he continues to lie about uh, what is happening in, in Ukraine. And uh, it, it is a little surreal, and particularly in 2014, uh, 25 years after the, the Berlin Wall came down, uh, to be having the kinds of conversations that were quite normal during the Cold War, in which uh, there was clear evidence of, at that case, Soviet actions, uh, whether it is by deploying missiles in Cuba or what have you, uh, that were blatantly denied uh, by Russian officials, including Russian leaders. We're seeing that again today. Uh, we have a propaganda system inside uh, Russia uh, that makes those kinds of claims perhaps credible to the Russian public, uh, but with the kind of information penetration we have, as you mentioned, on the Internet, uh, satellite information, pictures that are being released uh, all over the place, uh, the only people who now believe that Mr. Putin is telling the truth are those uh, around Mr. Putin himself, but that certainly isn't anybody else. So let me ask you this. Uh, when this first started in Crimea, uh, was it a mistake for NATO not to take stronger action at that point? Well, I think there was a, a shock to the system, the, and, and a disbelief, particularly, what, what was it, 10 days after the, the completion of the Sochi Olympics, uh, that something like this could actually happen in a Europe that that really for uh, a long time now had uh, had been peaceful in which co there was economic uh, cooperation uh, with Russia uh, that one would see the kind of behavior that last seen in Europe in at the time of World War II uh, in which the argument that Russian speaking not just Russian citizens Russian speaking people uh, anywhere uh, uh, would be would have to be protected by uh, by Moscow and the Russian-speaking people in Brighton Beach, New York. Uh, are they to be included or in Tel Aviv uh, under those circumstances? So there was a, uh, a, a shock to the system. So you fe uh, do you feel there was just a, a moment of disbelief that this is actually yeah, occurring? Yeah, I think, there, mm -hmm. I think there was. I mean, I'm, you know, I've been looking at this stuff for uh, a good 30-some years, and mm -hmm. I was uh, uh, surprised uh, to see it happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think... The immediate reaction from NATO uh, was to focus on, let's make sure that at least those countries that are members of NATO, and Ukraine is not, mm -hmm. uh, yes. there is a, uh, uh, but those countries that are members of NATO, and there are five who are uh, bordering both Russia and Ukraine, including the three Baltic states, mm -hmm. that we focus on convincing them that their security uh, is will be guaranteed mm -hmm. by NATO. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to take our first break, uh, but when we come back, let's talk about the Ukraine and the fact that uh, uh, they did ask to be admitted to NATO, in fact, several times, but uh, didn't meet NATO's qualifications. And uh, maybe if they had been, uh, this could have been avoided. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Costa Report. No matter what business you're in, what happens in Washington can make the difference between business success or failure. That's why understanding where government is headed is so important in today's competitive business environment. 
But where can you find experts who know firsthand the inner workings of our nation's capital? The American Program Bureau is your leading source for speakers whose experience offer unique insights into where U.S. policy is headed. Speakers like Seth Harris, former acting U.S. Secretary of Labor, Alyssa Mastromonaco, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, and General Carl Eikenberry, former U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan. For your next meeting or conference, contact the American Program Bureau at apbspeakers.com or 617-614-1600. That's apbspeakers.com. The American Program Bureau, making history one speech at a time. The holiday season is just around the corner, and I want to share one of my favorite tips for being able to avoid that last-minute dash to buy something that screams, I didn't put much thought into this. Now imagine a different scenario this year. Imagine the surprise on your loved one's face when they open the first page of the Watchman's Rattle and see a custom dedication in their name by the author. The best part is it's so easy. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com, do it right now, and click on the book cover and presto. In less than three minutes, you can request the inscription you want. So do it now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com, and this year, give an affordable, thoughtful gift that says, this is for you and only you. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Those who say you can't have your cake and eat it too haven't driven a new Ford C-Max or Fusion Energy plug-in hybrid. Hi, I'm Elliot Geis over here at North Bay Ford in Santa Cruz. You can have the best of both worlds with our new Ford Energy hybrids. You can have the ultra-fun driving pleasure of cruising around town on the electricity stored in the energy state-of-the-art lithium-ion battery. Then, after 20 or so miles, you can switch the energy's hybrid engine and drive another 600 miles. So you see, you can't have your cake and eat it too when you drive a new Ford C-Max or Fusion Energy car right off the lot at North Bay Ford. But don't take my word for it. Come on down to North Bay Ford and test drive a C-Max or Fusion Energy today. The best deals of the year A new energy cars are ready to roll here at North Bay Ford. You can have your cake and eat it too. Ford plug-in hybrids give you the choice of cruising around town on pure electricity stored in the car's lithium-ion battery or switching to hybrid mode and driving another 600 miles on a single 12-gallon tank. Come on down to 1999 Soquel Avenue, Santa Cruz, or on the web at NorthBayFord.com. Hi, I'm Sam Quinn for Shirt Crafters, and I'm here with Shirt Crafters owner Scott D. Gold. And Scott, what do you think sets Shirt Crafters apart? Well, Sam... It starts with our graphic design department. We can take any tired old logo and turn it into an eye-grabbing brand. Then we can make that logo stand out in the community by turning it into a full-size vehicle decal. Next, we put that logo on polos, hats, and t-shirts, and just about anything else you can think of for your employees and customers for promotional purposes. And that's how we brand your business with Shirt Crafters. Top quality design and printing, fast turnaround, and right on the price. Shirt Crafters is located at 111 Engle Street in Santa Cruz, or go to shirtcrafters.com. You can give them a call at 831-423-0537. That's Shirt Crafter at 831-423-0537. Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former U.S. Representative DeNato and a current president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Evo Dalder. And before the break, you were saying that the Russian invasion into Crimea came as a bit of a shock to the system, and NATO's first response was to issue neighbor, neighboring NATO countries um, uh, a, a assurance that they would be protected. Um, as I understand it, uh, the Ukraine approached NATO several times wanting to join NATO. Uh, and Do you have any knowledge on why the Ukraine was denied admission? And, and more importantly, uh, is it your belief that if they had been admitted into NATO that uh, Putin would be aggressing today? Uh, well, those are two, two important questions. Um, they did, uh, Ukraine did approach uh, NATO a number of times, particularly in the mid uh, of the, la- the middle, middle part of the last uh, decade, 
um, and, and said, we, we really would like to become members at some point in the future, and could you help us uh, with that? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was, frankly, a disagreement within the alliance. Uh, the United States, uh, supported by many of the new East European allies, all thought this was a, a good idea, that we should uh, move in that direction. Um, Germany and France and other countries uh, were not yet prepared to say, listen, if we're going to do that, uh, we need to be serious about the willingness to defend these countries. And right now, I don't think, uh, this is what the Germans said, not right now, uh, we're not convinced that we are serious. That was particularly true not only with regard to Ukraine, but Georgia, uh, a country that is uh, only an eastern Turkey uh, 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 the territory that uh, links only to eastern Turkey, so very far away from the rest of where Europe is. Uh, Ukraine, of course, is is a is right next door to NATO territory, uh, but that was the main reason. Then, uh, to be honest, uh, in 2010, when a new government was elected in Kiev, uh, the same government that in the end uh, failed uh, and, and and was removed uh, from power uh, in uh, earlier this year. Uh, said that they didn't want to become our, uh, members of NATO. So by the time that I was the ambassador at NATO in, in Brussels, mm-hmm. uh, the Ukrainian official position was, we want to be independent both from NATO and from Russia. And NATO's view was, if that's your choice, then of course that is your right to make uh, to make that choice. I do think uh, that being a member of NATO is is means something. It means that you get a c- commitment not only from the United States, but from all other members, that they will defend you. It's one reason why one should take the question of whether to allow new members to come in very seriously. It's an obligation. But it's also one, yeah. You're taking it on is an a obligation. Huge obligation. Sure. But, but if and, a country and, wants to be part of NATO and they don't meet all of NATO's requirements, uh, is there any possibility of giving them provisional status that might allow countries like the Ukraine to enjoy the support of maybe a provisional support of NATO allies while giving them some pathway to uh, earn membership? Well, this is this is an issue that was uh, uh, debated and has been debated for the last 20 years. Uh, in part, the answer is yes. There is a there are a whole bunch of programs and 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 uh, ways you can help a country to get ready for actually being admitted in NATO. Uh, but there's a pretty firm belief within the alliance, uh, one I I share, that there is a fundamental distinction between being in or being out. Mm-hmm. And when you're in, uh, the obligation is absolute. Everybody will come in to to defend you. When you're out, there is no obligation. Doesn't mean you you don't you can't defend those countries, um, but there is no obligation. Uh, and and I think that bright line between being a member and not a member is an important one, um, uh, because uh, once you make the obligation to defend someone, you actually have to do it. Uh, and well, what about using NATO as a model for an Eastern European NATO? Well, why not create a second version of uh, NATO for those Eastern well, European countries that, that perhaps the current NATO countries don't want to overextend and feel that they have to support? Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, those parts of Eastern Europe that are not yet part of NATO, you really are talking about Belarus. Uh, you're talking about Ukraine and Georgia, Moldova. Uh, all parts of the former uh, Soviet Union. Yeah, the countries uh, that are and, under threat right now. Well, and they, in fact, have Russian troops on them, uh, on the border. So uh, the question is, who is going to make that commitment to defend each other? Are the Poles going to do it with, as NATO members now uh, to Ukraine? Uh, they're not ready to do that yet. Um, so the, the, the question is, it seems to me right now, is not NATO membership or no NATO membership. The question is, what are we going to do about what the Russians are doing in Ukraine? Uh, and it seems to me that, at the very least, we need to do three things. Uh, first, we need to support the Ukrainians politically and economically. It's a basket case economically. Uh, they need s- serious financial uh, assistance and political reform. Uh, secondly, we need to make the cost on Russia as high as possible so that continuing down this path, uh, they, uh, the cost they are paying is severe. That's what You mean by strengthening the doing. economic sanctions? Yeah, exactly. Which well, I think the, at the, the, G- at the G20, they all the nations came together and were in lockstep about that and warning Putin yeah, that so, that would be the, I, the consequence. That's right, and I think that's uh, that's you know the sanctions are already hurting. The the fall in oil prices are hurting. 
uh, Russia, and the costs are becoming severe. And then thirdly, the, I think it's time, and I've said so for quite some time, uh, that we provide lethal assistance and training uh, to the Ukrainian military uh, to allow them to defend themselves in their own country. Uh, I'm not, nor have I heard many other people say that this is the time where U.S. troops or European troops need to start uh, confronting uh, directly in Ukraine uh, the Russian uh, the Russian forces. Uh, I'm not in favor of that, uh, at least not at this point. Uh, uh, but I am in favor of providing lethal aid uh, to Ukraine, and that combination of steps of increasing economic pressure on Russia. Uh, supporting Ukraine politically and economically and providing lethal uh, assistance for Ukraine to do a better job of defending itself, uh, I think are now the kinds of things we're, that are called for. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly seemed at the G20 that uh, folks were in uh, lockstep. Uh, should we read anything into Putin's early departure? Yeah, I think uh, I think Putin is best seen as a, uh, as a child that wants to get its way, and he stamped uh, his feet and decided to go home because he wasn't finding anybody who wants to play with him. Uh, I mean, he had a very tough meeting with, uh, with Chancellor Merkel for four hours, uh, where she came out and then blasted him in a speech she gave to students uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Australia. Uh, he, every confrontation uh, he had or every meeting he had with uh, with leaders from President Obama to Prime Minister Harper to everyone else was a was a confrontation. He clearly felt uh, uh, belittled. He, uh, he may have seen the picture. He was put all the way on the far side, far away from the middle where the where the major powers are uh, standing. And he decided, you know, if you're going to behave that way, then there, there's not much for me to do. Uh, I think was that his answer to the G20 leaders? Yeah, in some ways it was. It's sort of, you know, I I, I got to go home. Uh, he apparently needed a long sleep in order to be able to work, uh, be fresh at work on Monday. Uh, that was his, his excuse. I think the real, the real image we saw here was of a country and a leader that is increasingly isolated uh, and is increasingly having to find a way to, uh, to get what it wants. And uh, that's what happens to bullies uh, who behave in the way that Mr. Putin has behaved. Right. Well, we did see some uh, playground justice at the G20. <laughs> I guess we've I guess we've stooped to that. I, I hate to say it, but I guess we have. And we have to take another short break. When we come back, uh, we'll talk about the future of NATO. You're listening to the Costa Report. Big data is being generated by everything around us all the time. Every digital process and social media exchange produce it. Systems, sensors, and mobile devices transmit it. Big data is arriving from multiple sources with ever-increasing velocity, volume, and variety. It's becoming the world's newest resource for competitive advantage, allowing decision-making to move from the elite few to the empowered many. The escalating demand for insights requires a fundamentally new approach to architecture, tools, and practices. To extract meaningful value from big data, you need optimal processing power, analytics capabilities, and skills. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. That's www.ibm.com slash big data. Imagine a medical system that offers the range of care you want with the electronic communication you need. Physicians Medical Group of Santa Cruz is that care provider with hundreds of independent doctors sharing information with each other, labs, hospitals, and pharmacies electronically. Your PMG physician is looking at real-time data and your real-time care needs. Find your doctor at pmgscc.com. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, 
it may change your life. Everyone knows estrogen is for women, right? Well, not exactly. The so-called female hormone is in reality as much or more of a stress management hormone for both genders than it is a woman's hormone. While it's true that estrogen plays an important role in the development of the female reproductive system, it also plays a significant role in the development of the male reproductive system as well. In fact, contrary to common wisdom, estrogen is a male hormone as much as it is a female hormone. It helps keep a guy's bone healthy and plays a role in the health of his connective tissue too. Inflammation, migraine headaches, immune system activation, hypertension, anxiety, decreased libido are all part of the estrogenic response and can make you miserable whether you're a man or a woman. Because estrogen is processed by bile and in the liver, if you have any liver issues or if you had a gallbladder removed or intestinal problems, your risks for estrogenic health issues go up, whether you're a guy or a girl. And because probiotic bacteria in the gut play an important role in the detoxification of estrogen, if you're dealing with any digestive and especially intestinal problems like celiac disease or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, really any digestive health issue, your odds for estrogenic disease go up big time. A good strategy for protection from excess production of estrogen is to use digestive digestive enzymes after all your meals. Omega-6 and omega-3 essential fatty acids can help keep estrogen at a healthy level. And considering supplementing with both vitamins E and A, both of which are important for healthy estrogen processing, might be a good idea too. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos, too, at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. Hi, I'm Greg. And I'm Marlene. And we're the hosts of Flavors. On KSCO 1080. We're going to be talking about restaurants, cookbooks. Wine and reviews. And all sorts of other things. If you like olive oils, this is the place. So remember to tune in on Sundays at noon. And remember, Flavors Everything. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is former U.S. Representative to NATO and current president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Evo Dalder. I, I think, Mr. Dalder, you'd agree that the ultimate alliance uh, is the United Nations. Uh, and the United Nations does not seem to be taking an effective role in the Ukraine or even in the Middle East. And this puts a lot of pressure on organizations like NATO, the G20, and the United States and its allies to act uh, as an alternative. Um, how do you see that? What, what, where, what, it, what role does the United Nations have in this? Well, in theory, of course, it has a huge role. Uh, it is the ultimate guarantor of international security and, and international peace, at the, the charter of the United Nations. Uh, that we uh, worked so hard to forge in San Francisco in 1945 uh, sets forth pretty clear rules about how states should behave. Uh, and one of those uh, ways, and one of those rules is that countries don't use force to take other parts of other countries, uh, which is what happened when Russia annexed uh, uh, Crimea. Uh, the U.S. and its allies decided that it wasn't worth uh, going to the Security Council. Uh, with uh, a, uh, an argument that this was a clear violation because, of course, Russia is a member of the Security Council and has a veto. Uh, what uh, the U.S. did do uh, is to, uh, and, and others did, is to um, go to the General Assembly in which there was a major vote in which uh, support for Russia's actions was very, uh, was very small. Um, but th that, was a, that was a political statement. It didn't do much uh, practically. And this is a reality we faced during the Cold War. It's a reality we continue to face today, that as long as uh, countries like Russia have veto power uh, over uh, uh, any possibility of the U.N. to act as, as a United Nations, uh, when uh, the big powers do things that the other big powers don't like, uh, the U.N. is not the place to get anything done uh, because Russia or China or some other power will veto it. Uh, those actions. That's the that's the dilemma we've lived with since 1945, and it's not changed uh, uh, any time uh, in, in recent years. 
Um, so the UN can do uh, uh, through its agencies, the UN Refugee Authority or the Human Rights Commission, uh, can try to uh, alleviate suffering and deal with the consequences of, of wars. Uh, but its ability to actually stop conflict, uh, find political solutions to it, let alone authorize the kind of military actions that may be necessary, uh, that uh, uh, that ability is, is still borne by the fact that countries like Russia have a veto. Well, in many ways, when you see uh, the uh, superpowers of the United Nations take these kinds of uh, unilateral actions and nothing can be done within the United Nations to stop or deter them, in many ways it undermines the effectiveness of the United Nations and says that um, it's, a, it's a court of appeal only for lesser nations. Uh, that's true, and it's uh, been true for uh, for basically since the beginning. Uh, the the first and only time the UN really worked effectively was in 1950, uh, when through actually a, a one-time maneuver, uh, there was an, uh, a resolution uh, for peace which allowed uh, the United States and its allies to help South Korea in, in the attack from the north, mm-hmm. uh, which which was a UN operation uh, run by the UN. The UN is still informally in charge of that uh, of that process. But thereafter, it was clear that that couldn't happen, that the only way the United Nations can be effective is if the major powers agree. And there have been times where that's been the case. Uh, recall that uh, uh, in the Iraq War of 1990, uh, to liberate Kuwait. That was under a UN Security Council resolution in which the then Soviet Union and China uh, voted uh, uh, to uh, support the use of force. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even as late as, as uh, 2011, uh, the intervention in Libya uh, was supported by a UN resolution that allowed the use of force or all necessary means to protect civilians. Now, Russia didn't uh, vote for it, but it didn't vote against it, abstained. But the uh, United no Nations is not a likely forum to resolve the uh, the issues with the Eastern Bloc countries. In, not in Ukraine mm-hmm. and, frankly, not in the Middle East. Right. Uh, and we've seen that all along. So that means uh, the United States uh, needs to form coalitions. Uh, it needs to work with allies that it has in the region and outside mm-hmm. uh, to deal with the threats uh, that it faces. Well, well it, uh, which, it has, uh, which it has, which it has in this case, kind of and which it has in Iraq right. and Syria as well. Now, let's exactly. talk about NATO. Uh, in October, you wrote an article about the future of NATO, in which you began saying that there was some talk about whether NATO was needed anymore as their mission in Afghanistan was winding down. But certainly Putin's aggression in Crimea and the Ukraine have pretty much put an end to any talk of disbanding NATO. So what do you see ahead for NATO? Uh, well, I, I see, uh, at the very least, uh, a, a re um, vitalization of European security uh, efforts by the NATO countries. We see the 28 countries that are now members of NATO uh, working uh, much more closely together to make sure that they can defend the, the airspace and the sea lanes uh, and, uh, and the territory uh, of all NATO members. Uh, the kind of discussion that is now taking place in NATO capitals that was taking place in the NATO summit just uh, a few months ago in Wales uh, on how we make sure that we can deter Russia, uh, reassure allies. Uh, that kind of uh, conversation didn't take place when I was still there, and I've only been gone there for 16 months. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 so I, that's what Mr. Putin has done. He's put NATO back uh, in the center of the debate in most European capitals. Um, and uh, at the very least, this is an organization that will be there to protect its members. Uh, but in addition, uh, strengthening the capacity of NATO to defend its members also means that it can be strengthened as a means to deal with other security problems, as it has done in the past and may do so in the future. Many NATO countries are currently involved in the fight against uh, ISIS in, in Iraq. Yes. Uh, they are flying uh, aircraft and bombing uh, targets uh, using the kind of NATO um, uh, lessons they have learned in previous operations. It's not a NATO operation, but many NATO countries are there. And I think uh, you will, you're likely to see more of that in the future just because the capacity exists. Uh, and when the U.S. works together with its Western allies, particularly those in Europe, uh, it is the strongest military capability in the world. Uh, and when military force is necessary, which is not always necessary, but when it is, uh, doing it together with uh, capable allies is always uh, preferable than having to do it alone. 
Well, it almost looks uh, like we're facing a future of what I call situational alliances, where countries come together over very specific issues, and then they disband, as in the case of Afghanistan and now currently Iraq and Syria. Uh, and once they disband, um, do you see a role for NATO to play, as they did in Afghanistan, of uh, marching in peacekeeping forces in order to stabilize uh, the the economies? Yeah, potentially. I, I, I think I think those situational alliances, which do exist, uh, always at the core, uh, tend to have the United States and key allies, key NATO allies, to be frank. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's the Brits and the French, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, the Germans, in the case of uh, of now arming the Kurds in Iraq, uh, the Dutch, the Danes, the, uh, the Italians, the Spanish, the Canadians, uh, and I can go on. At the core, there is always some uh, NATO formation, the U.S. and key allies. So uh, you need that enabling mechanism uh, that NATO uh, that NATO provides to even have these situational alliances. Uh, whether that can be extended all the way to East Asia, I don't know. But it, uh, but at the very, it's definitely extended into uh, as far away as as Afghanistan, which is 7,000 miles away from Brussels. It's far, it's about as far as you can get. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, when you think about it, and, and in Afghanistan, it, it this this operation after the initial war, from 2004 onwards, this was a NATO operation, and it continues to be a NATO operation today. Uh, it's a NATO commanders. Uh, they uh, report to Brussels. They, in some cases, are uh, funded. Uh, the key components are funded by uh, uh, by NATO, and they and the political authority uh, of deciding what goes on there uh, it takes place in Brussels, uh, as well as, of course, in Washington and individual capitals. Mm-hmm. Now we have to take our final break, uh, but we'll be back in just a moment to talk a little bit about whether there's a comparison between what's going on in the Ukraine and the Cuban Missile Crisis, something we may have not thought about for a long time. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouth-watering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berrylicious dish. As a scientist who works hard to stay on top of current events and trends, I know how easy it is to get caught up in the details of a story and lose sight of the big picture. What is happening to society as a whole? Where are we headed? Why does it feel as if there's greater instability, unrest, and danger in the world? The truth is, very few of us have time to contemplate these questions. And if we're waiting for our leaders or the media to paint a clear picture, well, we may be in for a long wait. That's why I'm urging you to grab a copy of The Watchman rattle. Do it now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com. Find out why scientists, government leaders, and the heads of the largest corporations in America are waking up to a newly uncovered pattern of human behavior. That's the Watchman's Rattle at RebeccaCosta.com, a bestseller in 26 countries and a book that Richard Branson, Donald Trump, and experts everywhere are calling a must-read. That's the Watchman's Rattle, available at bookstores everywhere and online at RebeccaCosta.com. There are 700,000 horses in California, and I'm wondering how they get around. Hello, Michael Olson here, RV Service Center, 2525 Mission, way up at the top of Santa Cruz with Rena Mills, the owner. Rena, how do they get around? They all get around in horse trailers. And yes, we service horse trailers here at RV Service Center. We do axles, we do leak repair, we do wiring, brake, we do insurance, we do it all. 
The number one neglect I see most often, Michael, are the axles. Axles need to be serviced every 5,000 miles or two years, and that keeps you rolling along smoothly and getting to your destination. What happens if you don't service the axles? You know those people you see alongside of the road waiting for AAA? That's what happens when you don't service the axles. We offer 20% discount to any members of the Santa Cruz Horsemen's Association. So if you've got a horse, trailer, bring it on down to RV Service Center. RV Service Center, way up at the top of Santa Cruz, 2525 Mission, Right off Highway 1, can't miss it. RV Service Center has been locally owned and operated since 1976. For the last 60 years, Coast Paper and Supply has been serving locals and businesses for all their cleaning and paper supply needs. With an 1,800-square-foot showroom and nearly 5,000 products, you'll find everything you're looking for in the way of janitorial supplies, retail and industrial packaging, and disposable food service products for business or home. Not to mention their huge selection of boxes and shipping supplies. Their family-owned and operated business is located at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Call 831-423-3350 or visit Coast Paper Supply Inc.com, a proud member of Think Local First. Hi, this is Sean. And I'm Steph. Join us Saturdays at 7 p.m. for Out in Santa Cruz as we share our views of the LGBTQ community and the issues and insanity of the week. Only on KSEO 1080 AM. Like us on Facebook.com slash Out in Santa Cruz. Listen to past episodes at OutInSantaCruz.com. I'm Sean. And I'm Steph. And, and you've, you've been, been queered. queered. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and today my guest is foreign policy expert Evo Dalder. Uh, Mr. Dalder, th- there have been a lot of experts that have been comparing the current Ukraine crisis to what happened in Georgia and uh, also the Russian uh, invasion in Crimea. But I haven't heard anyone uh, compare this to um, what the U.S. faced during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Castro and the Russians were denying missile construction in Cuba. All the while, the evidence that the work was going on was growing uh, from satellite pictures to firsthand accounts. As you know, this was a tense moment in our nation's history and one that uh, President Kennedy felt uh, could only be cured by a show of force. Um, Is that what NATO needs to do? Uh, I I know that uh, we're working on very stringent economic sanctions but uh, we didn't take any action in Crimea. It sounds like we're kind of holding back in uh, in the Ukraine. Um, what about a, making a show of force, as President Kennedy did? Well, of course, President Kennedy not only had a show of force, uh, and, and by the way, this was right in our backyard, but he was also willing to engage in diplomacy, and, and uh, there were secret talks that he conducted. In fact, his brother, uh, Bobby uh, Kennedy, conducted with the... Uh, Ambassador uh, in uh, the U.S. and the Soviet uh, ambassador in Moscow, and as we now know, there was a deal made to remove not only the missiles from uh, from uh, Cuba, but uh, also aging missiles from from Turkey, uh, in order to to resolve this. In the end, to resolve this, um, I think that the, the situation is similar, but also different. It's similar in the sense that, really, for the first time in in 25 years, uh, Russian leaders, including Putin, uh, are starting to rattle nuclear sabers. Uh, we have seen these nuclear bomber flights uh, all through uh, European, uh, along the European coast, and indeed now the warning that they're going to go all the way to uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we've seen uh, multiple uh, missile tests from submarine-launched missiles and land-based missiles, uh, all designed to uh, to rattle sabers. And we've seen Mr. Putin reminding the the, uh, the world uh, time and again that. Uh, Russia is not only a strong military power, but is a strong nuclear power. And it's that kind of behavior, uh, fr- frankly, quite reckless uh, behavior that we saw, of course, uh, with Khrushchev in 1962 when he uh, deployed missiles in, in Cuba. So uh, what is Putin's uh, we, plan, in, in your view, in your personal opinion? What a, do you think yeah, is his my, plan? Is he trying to rebuild the Soviet Union? In some ways he is. I think he's a bully. Uh, and I think he is trying to reestablish uh, uh, Russian control over over its immediate neighbors, um, and uh, uh, and I think our our policy must be what it what it was during the Cold War, which is uh, to make clear that there are places in which he cannot go, 
and we should reinforce. And if there's a question of a show of force, it's about uh, deploying more troops to Europe, more aircraft to Europe. We've taken a lot out. It's time to start bringing them back. Uh, but also to put the pressure and, and raise the cost on, on uh, Russia in the same way that we did during the Cold War when we raised the cost on the Soviet Union, ultimately leading to its collapse. But you make uh, a good point. We were not only using uh, tools such as economic sanctions and uh, uh, diplomacy, but we were also at, uh, simultaneously uh, having a show of force. Uh, are are, right. are we making a mistake not doing that now? I think I think we should do more on the on the uh, use of force on the force front uh, without necessarily using them. I'm not in favor of marching our troops into into Ukraine. I am in favor of putting more troops in in Europe. I am in favor of uh, bringing some uh, of the brigades, army brigades that were pulled back into uh, into places like Texas. Uh, to put them back into Germany and perhaps uh, moving them forward even further. I am in favor of bringing some of the aircraft that were pulled out uh, back over so to demonstrate that we're serious. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think we need to uh, we need to increase the cost, continue to increase the cost on Russia, uh, find alternative uh, means to provide energy in Europe, including by exporting our own uh, gas uh, and, uh, and, and our own uh, oil in order to reduce, continue to reduce prices. Uh, on the world market, because it's that economic pressure that ultimately is what's going to make uh, the difference. Uh, Putin may not think that the pressure matters, but his people will. Uh, when they start feeling uh, the kind of uh, economic dislocation that these sanctions, as well as the changing oil market, uh, are bringing about, uh, uh, the, the consequences uh, for his ability to maintain in power and to, to stay in power will uh, will be severe. And that's the kind of policy that ultimately won the Cold War without a direct military confrontation. And I think that's the kind of policy we should be looking at again. Today. Well, the greatest instrument uh, relative to economic sanctions, as you point out, is oil. Cheaper oil prices uh, deals a greater blow to the uh, Russian economy than any other single um, instrument we have. That's right. Uh, the Russian economy, the Russian Russian economy needs oil prices at about a hundred dollars a barrel uh, in order to balance uh, the Russian budget. We're now at seventy-five dollars a barrel, mm -hmm. uh, in part because uh, demand in Europe and China is lower than expected in part because uh, uh, OPEC countries, and particularly the Saudis, have decided that they're more interested in market share than they are in prices, yeah. and in part because we are producing a lot more oil and a lot more gas uh, than we have in a very long time mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, uh, horizontal drilling and, and, uh, and the fracking revolution. Uh, and that is what's depressing oil prices worldwide. It's great for our economy. Uh, by the way, it's the biggest... Uh, uh, the biggest infusion of cash in people's pockets uh, that we could have hoped for. Uh, but it's it's even better when it comes to trying to have an impact in countries like Russia and Venezuela, which are, as, as Tom Friedman in the New York Times put it, are petro states, mm -hmm. uh, petro, petro dictatorships. Uh, uh, when the petro goes away, the dictatorship may as well. Uh, and it and certainly that, doesn't it, hurt our national security. Uh, because no, as we all know, oil is really tied to uh, uh, to uh, security from foreign nations in the Middle East. Um, before we run out of time, is there a website where listeners can go to stay current with your work? Absolutely. They can go to uh, www.thechicagocouncil.org, uh, which has all of the great stuff that we do here in Chicago in terms of our studies on public opinion, on agricultural and national security. Now, and, I have to warn uh, listeners, web. when they go to that website, expect to spend hours on it. I, I couldn't get well, off good. the website. <laughs> well, I'm very glad to say that. It is brand new. We, we started it, uh, uh, we completely re, uh, redid it uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we are uh, uh, we are web streaming most of our programs. We do about 180 programs a year, uh, small ones to large ones, from Ebola to innovation to... Uh, uh, the future of ISIS and what to do about Ukraine. So I Absolutely fascinating and rich with content and bipartisan, just the kind of stuff that we love to uh, support here at, at the Costa Report. So I, I have to encourage people to 
uh, go and check the website out. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have today. But before we let you go, I, I want to take a moment to thank you for your service to our country and the good work you're doing there in Chicago. Thank you, Mr. Dalder. Well, thank you, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. enjoyed the conversation. Thank you and come back soon. If your station is leaving us after the first hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Evo Dalder today, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're all over the Internet now. Uh, Not long ago, there was some question as to whether NATO was necessary, but if we want an objective measure as to how unstable the world has become during the last, let's just say, five years, The fact that the G20 has taken the role of rebuking Putin and NATO has uh, been called back into action is is a pretty good indicator. Not only is peaceful coexistence in the Middle East under threat, uh, so is Eastern Europe, African nations, and let's not forget North Korea's nuclear threat in Asia. I, I know you're as bewildered as I am about what can be done to tame this unrest. So send me your comments. Uh, by going to our webpage, that's RebeccaCosta.com. Just click on the word contact at the very top of the homepage, and it'll take you right over to a big white box where you can type in your comments and your thoughts. And if you missed the full interview with Dalder or any of our previous guests, remember that you can unload previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our YouTube channel. You can also find our weekly radio blog, which captures the top headlines from our interview ever, every week. Uh, so if you miss a program, you can still hear about what our guests had to say by reading the radio blog. It's short, it's to the point, and uh, nothing puts you in touch with the world faster than listening to the Costa Reporter reading our blog once a week. My guest next week is the president of the National Iranian American Council, an organization which advocates normalizing U.S. relations with Iran to bring stability to the Middle East. Is Iran destined to play a pivotal role in the peace process? Ask anyone in Washington, D.C. today, and they'll tell you that negotiating with Iran is tricky business. Find out why when Trita Parsi joins us next week right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second an hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Now, if you've been listening to the Costa Report, you know that I'm a big fan of wines by Caraccioli Cellars, and today I'm here with Scott Caraccioli who's one of the brains behind the most memorable wines money can buy. So I have a question for you. How did your family get into the wine business? Um, You know, in 2006, my father, his brother and uncle were really playing with the idea of planting a vineyard and planting a vineyard turned into making a bottle, turned into making sparkling wine when um, Michelle came into the picture. So it was really kind of an organic situation, us being in agriculture in the Salinas Valley, and then the extension of that went to grapes, and here we are today. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, where one bottle is never enough. Prices are for base buildings only. If 2015 is a year for your business to grow and you need to build, call General Steel today before you spend thousands more than you should. General Steel pre-engineered buildings could save you as much as half the cost and time of conventional construction. As much as half. Get a 5,000 square foot building for under 35,000 or 10,000 square feet for an unbelievable price under 75,000. We'll design a building to fit your needs and best of all, you can stop paying rent. For office buildings, strip malls, church buildings, manufacturing and much more, you just can't beat a General Steel price. Call now to lock in 2014 prices and build in 2015. Call General Steel today at 898 Steel. Don't pay thousands more than you should. Call now and get the best prices in years. Call 898 Steel. We'll lock in your 2014 price for 90 days. Call 800 987 8335. Surfing Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz.
This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome back to the second hour of the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and during the first hour today, we had an opportunity to speak to former United States permanent representative to NATO in the Obama administration, Mr. Evo Dalder. And given Putin's early departure from the G20 summit after having his hand slapped both privately and publicly by G20 nations, the, the world is on watch now to see what Russia's next move will be. And while the media is busy making comparisons to the Cold War, I think the present tension with Russia may just be NATO's Cuban Missile Crisis. What we have in the Ukraine is the leader of a country, uh, in this case Russia, denying that they pose any threat. The same situation Kennedy once faced when satellite images revealed the Soviet Union was preparing to deploy ballistic missiles in Cuba. These 13 days in 1962 were the closest the world has come to finding out what a nuclear war would be like, as the Soviet Union and Castro continued time after time to deny at every turn the presence of ballistic missiles 90 miles off the coast of the United States. It wasn't until Kennedy made the bold decision which has been argued by historians as to whether this was the right thing to do or not. I mean, history has proven it it worked, but that's a different decision as to, you know, that's a different point than as to whether it was right or not. But but, uh, this didn't end until Kennedy made the decision to make a show of force. Um, it, It wasn't until that show of force that constructive negotiations to disassemble the missiles in Cuba began along with something which was not known to the American public at the time, the dismantling of U.S. missiles, which were aimed at the Soviet Union from Italy and and Turkey. Uh, In other words, in in this case, the show of force resulted in both sides backing down. And, And this was the price of peace in those 13 days while the world held its breath. It seems to me that we have come to that crossroads yet again. There is indisputable physical evidence that Russian tanks, artillery, and troops are crossing into the Ukraine from multiple points. Uh, They are arming and fighting alongside pro-Russian rebels, Uh, the same rebels who are charged with attacking Malaysian Airlines flight MH17, which caused the death of 278 civilians. Yet Putin has consistently denied Russian involvement, claiming that the situation in the Ukraine is a civil war, uh, and also that the West is somehow attempting to turn the court of public opinion against Russia by making false accusations and, and more importantly, urging other nations to impose harsh economic sanctions on Russia. Putin's point is that the Russian soldiers are simply there to protect uh, Russian nationals uh, who uh, feel threatened and have asked for Russia's protection. Um, you know... The, the response Russia and Cuba took during the missile crisis, even when photographic proof of ballistic missiles was presented to them, was that, uh, you know, the photographs were wrong. It simply wasn't true. It was some misunderstanding on the part of the United States. Uh, it was only after Kennedy gave the order to establish a military blockade that the Soviets and uh, Cuba came to the negotiation table a point that should not be forgotten. Now in the year 2014, NATO faces a similar Cuban missile crisis. But instead of Cuba, uh, the background is the Ukraine. And you heard uh, Mr. Dalder say that uh, NATO was shocked. In fact, their failure to act in Crimea may have simply been the, um, the disbelievability that Russia was on the move again. Uh, If the instincts of President Kennedy were right, um, it's going to take more than a show of unity on the part of NATO, more than economic sanctions. It'll require a show of force, a blockade of NATO military forces, if you will, to get Russia to stop denying their actions in the Ukraine. Uh, it, It will also likely require the United States or NATO countries to make some concessions. Russia won't back down with it without concessions, uh, as we found out when the United States uh, removed Jupiter missiles 
aimed at Russia from Italy and Turkey, a, a fact that uh, many people, uh, many American citizens didn't learn about till many, many years after the Cuban Missile Crisis. As there appears to be no evidence Putin's Russia plans to retreat from the Ukraine, NATO would be wise to look at the Cuban Missile Crisis for two tactics that brought us to the brink and then back again. The need for a show of force, followed by the need to make a concession. Given that there is a successful model to tame Soviet aggression and also their denial, uh, there's another reason to be hopeful that the conflict in the Ukraine can be stopped, and that is this time the United States is not acting alone. Uh, the great difference between the 1960s mi- missile crisis is that we live in a time when the c- court of public opinion is on the side of alliances and not on sole state actors. So from this perspective, NATO represents a a far more powerful negotiator than the United States acting alone. Uh, Imagine that during the Cuban Missile Crisis had Kennedy's blockade consisted of military personnel of the U.S. and other countries, 26 other countries, uh, 28 other countries. I think it's uh, 28 countries in NATO. That's something that uh, we certainly need to think about. Uh, Kennedy acted alone, uh, in this case in the Ukraine, uh, it were NATO forces to uh, elect to make a show of power. Uh, it would be the, it would be military forces from 28 countries, and that certainly makes a a stronger statement. On that note, we're going to take another short break, and when we come back, Sam Quentin and Bill Graff will be joining me in our weekly roundtable, where you have a conservative, a diehard conservative, a diehard liberal, and an independent all work together to try to find common ground. And here's the wonderful thing. More often than not, we do find something we agree on. And no one's more shocked than the three of us who see each other in the radio station here every week. Uh, So we'll be right back where the three of us will talk about uh, the situation in the Ukraine, the Soviet Union, Putin, and the future of NATO. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, registered pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. The best thing you can do for allergic reactions, believe it or not, build your immune system. What you're having is an immune system response. That means a defensive response. Your body's trying to protect you. So all those signs of allergies like watery eyes and a runny nose and stuffy head, all of those are signs that fluid is beginning to leak inside your head in response to this attack. The fluidization is one of the ways the body flushes things out. So when you tear, the body's trying to flush things out of the eye area. When your uh, blood vessels inside your head open up, your body's trying to flush things out of your sinus cavities. When you have mucus secretion, your body is trying to protect itself by secreting a protective layer between the allergen and tissues in the body. We don't want to suppress that. It's the body's protective mechanism. What you want to do is you want to boost the immune system. Number one thing to do is to reduce what's called the load. Think of the immune system as a dump truck and it has a capacity. When the immune system is working on problem foods, bacteria or toxins, and then all of a sudden it has another load that it has to work on, say pollen, it becomes overloaded. My number one digestive supplement for dealing with these seasonal allergies is a good probiotic supplement. Secondly, vitamin C, vitamin A is really important. Zinc and vitamin A work together. Don't forget about magnesium. Really, really important for the immune system. Make sure you're drinking a lot of fluids. That can also help flush toxins out of the body and significantly reduce the risks of an early demise. Hi, this is Rebecca Costa, host of the Costa Report. If you'd like to get in touch with pharmacist Ben Fuchs, let me tell you the quickest, easiest way to communicate with the only pharmacist I know that isn't in a hurry to dispense pharmaceuticals. Sounds funny, doesn't it? A pharmacist who believes pharmaceuticals should be used as the last resort, not the first. You can reach pharmacist Ben right now at RadioBenHealth.com. That's RadioBenHealth.com. And if you'd like to know more about unique nutritional supplements like Beyond Tangy Tangerine or the Healthy Start Pack program, it's the same web address, RadioBenHealth.com. Find out why pharmacist Ben and millions like him are enjoying a healthy, energetic lifestyle by adding mineral supplements to their daily routine. Visit RadioBenHealth.com, RadioBenHealth.com, and get started today. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? 
Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural 